Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So what am I holding here? Well, it's a sword, it's a saber. No big surprise in Matt Easton's study because, you know, as you all know, I love sabers. I love other types of sword as well. And um, I noticed that it was favorably received that I started talking again about medieval weapons again recently. And I'm definitely gonna be doing more medieval stuff. And in fact, yesterday, this is a tangent to what I was intending to film, but yesterday I was at the Wallace Collection uh, with two other people. Um, and um, we did a bunch of filming actually, and it's pretty much, well, it is all medieval related. So uh, there's plenty of medieval material coming up. But just to talk about swords for a little bit. Um, so what I'm holding here is actually quite a special sword. It requires cleaning. I've actually not had it very long myself, so it needs a bit of restoration work doing on it, but the blade is in pretty nice condition. In fact, it's all in fairly good condition. Um, but there are three features which make this sword non-regulation. Now, for those of you who really know me really well, uh, you will know that my, the, the kind of the nucleus of my personal collection and what I really covet more than anything else are swords that are um, made for British officers in the mid to, mid to late Victorian period. Um, actually the entire Victorian period, thinking about it, um, and that are different in some way than the normal regulation models. The reason to explain why I like non-regulation swords more than regulation ones, although I do have plenty of regulation ones as well, is because it shows a, a larger than average degree of caring about swords and swordsmanship. And obviously, you know, big surprise, I care about swords and swordsmanship. So I'm a bit of a sword obsessive. I think a bit is probably putting it very mildly. Um, and uh, clearly I run, you know, I'm also a fencing instructor. So I'm a fencing instructor, very interested in military history, particularly Victorian uh, colonial history um, and hand-to-hand -hand combat across a wide uh, sort of period of time in many areas. But Therefore, when I find a British officer's sword that is different from the norm, I'm really attracted to that for a number of reasons. Partly aesthetically, some of the design choices I prefer the actual look of, um, but also it's because it shows very often that either that officer or in some cases the person who bought the sword for that officer really cared about sword design. And I find sword design interesting on all sorts of levels. It's interesting from a practical point of view, the actual function of the, the sword as a weapon rather than just as something that an officer had to carry as a badge of office or for you know parade or this type of thing. It actually shows um, the function of the weapon. Um, but uh, it, it's also kind of almost an engineering challenge, isn't it? How do you make the perfect sword? And is there a perfect sword? Well, of course, as you know, viewers of my channel hopefully know by now, it's all about context and what's the perfect sword in one scenario might not be the perfect sword to choose in another scenario. Um, but anyway, it's a complicated topic, but what makes this unusual? Well, this particular sword has three particular features that are unusual about it. But before I go into those, I want to recommend that you look at the link right below my video here, which links to a new article I've just written. And that itself links to other articles I've written in the past. So these are all hosted on my Eastern Antique Arms website where I um, buy and sell uh, antique swords. But aside from that, I'm also uh, using it as a place to kind of um, concentrate some of my research um, into um, swords, into military swords. And um, so I'm putting articles up when I get the chance. I'm writing an article um, and, and posting it up there. So anyway, there's an articles page there and the newest article that I've put up is there. And now the newest article is about a sword which I saw um, roughly, t let's say 36 hours ago, not quite, a bit more than 24 hours. About 36 hours ago I saw it and um, it, it's an expensive sword. It's a very rare sword and I considered buying it um, but I decided that it was too expensive for me, uh, more expensive than I could justify, especially as I wouldn't, I knew that I would, if I did buy it, keep it. And therefore I would never see that money again. I would not like sell it. Um, so I thought, no, I'm gonna leave it there. But I, I slept on it and I thought about it and I was like, oh, that's such an amazing sword. And the article explains why it's such an amazing sword. It's for two essential reasons. One, one is because of the, um, the, the numbering or the dating on that sword. And second reason is because of the specifics of the design of that sword. And it's sort of historically quite an important sword for anybody who collects uh, British military swords. Um, but uh, I, I decided to sleep on it. And to my relief, I woke up to find that someone else, someone else had bought it and saved me 
thousands of pounds so I'm kind of quite happy that that happened uh, in a way and I'm, I hope that the person who bought it it may be that you watch this video at some point and, and um, if, if, if you are the person who bought that sword massive congratulations I hope you like the small article uh, that I wrote about it and I'm sure that you can add lots of research to it and and you know perhaps publish it and whatever um, but congratulations on buying it sword. it's an amazing piece and it's great to know that it still survives because many of us in the collecting uh, sort of world believed that that sword didn't exist we knew about it in the record it's been mentioned in books but we didn't know the actual sword still survived anyway that's great um, and congratulations now back to my sword here so this sword is actually very similar to that sword in a number of ways this is later in date though this is from the 1860s that swords from the 1850s and this sword is similar in the three same ways. In other words, it has a non-regulation grip, and I'll go into that detail in a minute, non-regulation guard, and a non-regulation blade. Now, my sword here is not um, as different as that sword. That sword has a very broad blade on it, a one and a half inch width um, blade. Mine doesn't. Mine has the standard one and an eighth width, width blade, which was the standard width for British infantry officers. But my blade is a little bit longer. I'm not boasting, but my blade is a little bit longer. Mine's 34 and a half inches. So the standard length was 32 and a half inches. This is 34 and a half inches. So, you know, it's got two inches of extra reach on the end, which I personally being six foot one, I would probably want that length blade because remember most Victorian officers probably were not as tall as I am. Um, the average height of Victorian officers, who knows, it's guessing, but in in the 19th century it's probably something like five foot eight or something like that so I'm probably quite a bit taller than the average I know John Musgrave Waite whose fencing treaties I teach from I actually have his med uh, um, not medical uh, army records and he's recorded as being um, six foot or six foot one I can't remember actually off the top of my head but essentially same kind of height as me and he was regarded as very tall in his time or or, or well above the average shall we say um, so there we go so generally speaking a 32 and a half inch blade for a, for a Victorian officer a modern person who's taller than the average Victorian officer would want a slightly long blade so this is about perfect for me 34 and a half inches it has a steel hilt why is that unusual so I have talked about the steel hilt in previous videos and quite simply infantry officers line infantry officers um, so not rifles or whatever um, they had to have a well they didn't have to have but they were it was regulation to have a gilt hilt okay that meant a gold colored hilt and usually that meant brass with gilding on top but officers who could afford it bought a steel hilt instead because it protects the hand better so in other words instead of the regulation brass hilt they chose a steel hilt so much better for protection. In fact, John Latham, who took over the Wilkinson um, company from Henry Wilkinson in um, the 1860s, actually talks about this and he talks about the fact that um, hilts should be made of steel rather than brass, ideally, because brass hilts could be smashed and cut through, uh, he says, in other words, broken by a strong blow from something like a tulwa. So uh, Indian officers who could afford it sometimes got steel hilts instead of um, brass hilts. This sword, incidentally, was not brought, bought by an Indian serving officer. This was bought by someone who'd served in the Crimean War and fought at the siege of um, Sevastopol. So, um, slightly different scenario, but similar kind of reasoning. He'd presumably seen combat and decided, yeah, my next sword, I want to get a steel hilt instead of a brass one. Um, and the final feature is a, let's try and get the camera to focus on it. There we go. You will hopefully be able to see down here a line which is the tang. And quite simply, that means that this sword is built uh, much like a, uh, a lang messer or a, or a knife, a kitchen knife or some certain types of bowie knife, whereby the tang is the full width of the handle. So the shape of the tang, it, the tang doesn't really get any thinner from the blade. It just carries on into the handle and comes down exactly like, if I just grab one, um, this type of uh, bowie knife, for example. Okay, so um, in other words, it's a very strong tang. So there's three features, full width tang, noted, no, known as the patent solid hilt, or sometimes just patent tang. Uh, and again, there's an article on my website linked below, which is talks more about that. So full width tang, steel guard instead of brass guard, 
and a different blade of some sort. You get different types of regulation, uh, non-regulation blade, sometimes longer, sometimes wider, sometimes more curved, sometimes more straight, sometimes more thrusty, sometimes more choppy, all kinds of things. So, uh, But this is just a bit longer than the normal. Um, anyway, so go and have a look at that article. If this kind of topic interests you at all, uh, please go and read my articles on the website. Um, obviously, they're up there for free, so anybody can read them and link them and post them. And, um, and uh, hopefully, it'll be of interest to you. And I will see you for the next video hopefully soon. Cheers folks! Thank you for watching, please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.